it's all about like screwing like just ordinary people because the other thing that they did him and his dad had a company allegedly called us tank where they i don't know what the hell that was but they would do work on behalf of other people and get paid kind of like sound like a contracting company and so what they would do is make their employees go and do the work and collect the money and then just not pay their employees What's going on, guys? Welcome to today's episode of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today is Wednesday. This is the Mike and Dan show. This is your first time here. This is the show where we teach you how to use real estate to make massive income, not just passive income. Oof. And I am your host, Mike Dahan, here with my co-host here, Dan Austin. And I apologize if I sound a little froggy today we uh just oh, wrapped throaty. up our keys con event yellow you know, throaty part of our keys con first in-person event for our instant investor program members uh-huh. and tell you what after talking for three straight days in the <laughs> scottsdale like dry air dry desert i mean you like to think you're adaptable and then you go to something that's really low intensity honestly and it just like takes you out man <laughs> yeah well it was a lot man like i mean the group brought their A game. And so it was like hard not to bring our A game and like bring, you know, bring the value. Yeah. It was a lot of fun too. And it was just like constant, just like so much engagement with people, which I love. Yeah. I mean, like realistically, every day we were between like doing our presentations. So so basically what KeysCon was is it was a mastermind slash boot camp for uh we had 15 of our instant investor program members out there, with the goal of it being to help them figure out how to go from kind of like the start basis of their business, right? Where the people are doing like one to three deals a month and how do they really start scaling, building a team and actually growing a business Mm -hmm. out of like, you know, just most of them are just single person operators, right? So we had a lot of, you know, boot camp and workshop stuff that we did. But on top of that, we were also just, you know, spending time with with all the folks there, networking, just talking with people. It's funny, I remember being like in the opposite seat not that long ago. Right. And you go and like every time you're having a conversation with someone, people want to like get in on the action. Yeah. Right. So yeah. they start gathering around. And then next thing you know, you're talking for literally 17 hours a day for yep. two days, two and a half days. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Which I mean, that's the the best part about going to any of these events is like finding your tribe of people that you want to be around. Mm-hmm. And at that point, like there's no energy issues. Like why you're on site, you're not low on energy. No. I mean, the guys there are probably sleeping even less than we were because they were like complete masterminding even into the late, late evenings and waking up early to do hikes and stuff together, which is so cool to see. And it's just like you see that instant like tribal, just like force pulling everybody together. And it's just like you have this high energy. I usually like crash after those. Oh, yeah. I mean, like we stayed in a different Airbnb. The place that they all stayed was this massive mansion. It was like a 9,000 square foot place, like a sick pool and a huge backyard. Hell yeah. But we stayed somewhere else. So I knew that we couldn't function if we were going to be up with what everyone else was going to be doing. If we're going to be with them all. Right? And every night we'd get back to the Airbnb. I would just uh, like zonk out so quick. Yeah, oh, yeah. Heck yeah. Wake up, but, get prepped for the next day and enjoy it. Was, yeah, but it was... It was like a lot of fun to just honestly like disconnect to mm-hmm. from everything else that keeps you busy from actually engaging and focusing on on one thing. And I think, you know, the group that was there could probably say the same thing, but then giving time for like some level of reflection as well. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. But overall, super successful first event. I was really excited for it. So if you guys want to come to the one next year, you uh, mm-hmm. need to join our instant investor program. It's exclusive to members of that. Took people through everything from figuring out how to fit themselves into their business to how to build a team, how to hire, how to, you know, interview, how to like build an org chart to how to actually like, you know, do sales and optimize a sales team, how to train your sales team, like basically just straight boot camp about how to, so you don't have to figure out the business parts of building a real estate business. We have them like the whole blueprint for it. Uh And one of the things too, I will say that's something that's hard to do exclusively in content. I really think that that's something that has to come in like a boot camp style conversation yep. because everyone's situation is a little bit different. Absolutely. Right? You have to have time for people to ask questions and kind of like think through it. And then also there's just so much content there. I don't know how you could just give it all and put it out there in a connected, succinct way like we were able to there. And just and there's so much stuff too within this content that like without context, 
it's really hard to understand. Like, so setting up the context of what we're all trying to do here. And we speak a lot about business systems and business management. Mm -hmm. Like obviously the real estate skills need to be there, but that's, that's like step one. Step two is like, how do you get this business to where you want to go? Which is literally all like business skills. Like that's why you say we talk a lot about hiring, talk a lot, a lot about how you structure your organization, because at some point you'll likely want to at least step out of the solopreneur role, even though that's just hiring one or two people to run systems for you. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the only way to scale after a while. Yeah. I mean, we have some people in that group there that were, you know, just savages in their business, but in order to continue growing, they need to get out of their own way. Mm -hmm. So either way, super good event. Uh, if you guys want to come next year, it will be next summer. And uh, it's for instant investor program members only. So mm -hmm. you should uh, sign up, check that out. Yeah, absolutely. Anyways, now we've been getting all caught up. We are pre-recording this episode a little bit. So some things might transpire over the next little bit. So we're currently recording this on the 14th of November and it'll be coming out right here on the 29th is when you're going to be listening to this. Uh, so if anything already happened or is behind, we apologize. Okay. Uh, but I am heading off to Japan tomorrow for a two and a half week little trip, little tourism sightseeing. I don't know, following the route that all the other white people that go to Japan go. There's kind of nice. like the list from like Tokyo to Kyoto to Osaka down to Hiroshima. That's like the route that all the tourists go when they go visit. You know what's interesting about Japan? What's that? Uh, I've, ne I've never been. Um, but when I see people visit, like all the photos and touristy stuff they do is like exactly what I expected it to look like. <laughs> yeah, right. And not in a bad way. It's just like, yeah. oh shit. Like they have like parts of the country that are still like in that like historical. Mm -hmm. I don't know, the historical look like what you would think like ancient Japan would look like. But then they have like super modern stuff, which you also think Japan would look like. Yeah. Yeah, and kind of everything in between. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm excited. I've heard good things. Um, it's a bucket list trip I wanted to do for a while, so I'm super excited to have the opportunity yeah. to go this time. This is going to be um, fun. But uh, yeah, so anyway, the past couple of days, sort of get re-caught up in one of the current things. I'm curious to see if something has come from this after, uh, by the time this episode comes out. But there's currently these videos going around by this guy on Instagram. I guess he's called The Goob. Is the like cube. his name. Is it the goob or noob or what is the, it? It's the goob. Yeah, he's like oh, technically a fitness guy, but he's been posting these just hate videos on Pace Morby that are freaking hilarious because he's basically just calling out all of the questionable stuff that Pace has been doing. It's goob underscore you two. Yeah, goob underscore you two. Yeah, it's fitness guy. But it started with the video we posted. Was it yesterday or maybe on Sunday? Mm -hmm. calling out Pace for filming himself, like evicting this old lady that had been in this tenant for like 30 years, which is super questionable. Like I, I know taste. we, it's super bad taste, right? I know we joke about crackheads and things on this show, but to like actually put that person's face like on video and to show yourself doing it as a piece of content, like shame on you. Like, come yeah, on. it's gross. You know, it's it's, really it's gross. super gross. It's super tacky. <laughs> so started with that and then, um, Video went huge. You got like, you know, almost half million views. All the, all the sub two like disciples were like, what? That's why I got so many views. <laughs> well, he does, he does bad things. And then <laughs> Pace responded to him, sent him some voice messages. And of course, what does this guy do? The guy's already stirring the shit. Yeah. He shares the recordings from Pace yeah. and just doubles down on it and is like, no, yeah. <laughs> you're a dirt bag. Yeah. And then starts doing all this background research on him and finds the, all these like past litigations that have been against Pace. Uh, I guess he's like been to jail, uh, mm -hmm. allegedly. Again, allegedly, go check out this guy's video. This is all stuff that he's posted. Um, and then talks about how his, he worked with his dad to have like this payment processing company where they were embezzling all these people's like federal, well, not tax, federal tax money. They had a payroll business and they stole allegedly over $2 million in people's tax filings or tax, federal tax money that they collected instead of, so let me set the context of this, Mike. Like, so for our payroll company, they withdraw from our bank account, like pay that we pay our staff. And then they also withdraw like the part of the money that goes to the IRS. And then they Earth. send that to the IRS. Like they do that for us. I assume they do it for us. They take it out of our bank account and send us invoices. So what they were doing was their payroll company was, you know, making payments to all the people that were on the payroll for that company they're running it for. And then taking that 15% of payroll tax and whatever, you know, income tax and all that stuff, taking that and just putting in their personal account instead of sending it to the IRS. I have to wonder how rampant that is, honestly, because that's, right. if you guys listen to any of our episodes from a couple of weeks ago, you heard us talk about 
um, the Frost and Croft company in Chattanooga. There was that huge accounting company that had stolen hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. That's literally what they were doing was the same thing, right? So that just makes me super. The thing that, that makes no sense, like that's worse than a Ponzi scheme because the federal government is down to clown. Like if you don't pay them, they will come calling. Yeah. And so you know at some point in time, someone's going to be knocking on your door. And it's actually going to be your clients because they're going to be like, what the hell? Because the IRS is going to be knocking on their door. There's just no, there's no exit plan. That's just straight like stealing money. It's such a short term vision. It's like the yeah. worst crime ever. It's like, it's like going <laughs> in. I don't, I don't know. Like, I can't even think of a good example. I'm not very good criminal. I don't I know. <laughs> like stealing money from the IRS and your clients. That's just, right. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's like stealing from the mafia. Like right. they will eventually yeah. find you and they will yeah. eventually kill yes. you. And they have okay. systems in place to do this. <laughs> Specific yeah, right. systems in place that are like, oh, you didn't pay your taxes. Yeah, right. I know. Yeah. They, they, in fact, the government is just like the world's most like legally accepted mafia. So yes. it's it, 100% the same thing. I want to touch on this because the, the worst part about it is, is he, it's all about like screwing like yeah. just ordinary people. Because the other thing that they did, him and his dad had a, company allegedly called U.S. Tank, where they, I don't know what the hell that was, but they would do work on behalf of other people and get paid, kind of like sound like a contracting company. And so what they would do is make their employees go and do the work and collect the money and then just not pay their employees. Mm -hmm. That's another yeah. like bottom it's of the barrel fast. dirt bag thing to do. Like if you're stealing, like I get Robin Hood. Okay. You're stealing from the rich, giving to the poor. He was stealing from like the average everyday people and just keeping it. It's almost like he's carried that message into his sub two bullshit that he does with his wealth without cash, where you have uh -huh. all these people that are not even sophisticated enough to know how to complete a sentence on Facebook uh -huh. posts, like in their Facebook posts in the group that are, he's teaching them how to go and get loans yes. for eight to $10,000 to buy into his program that they never are going to be able to perform on. Exactly. And, oh, you don't have money? Well, guess what? We got Gator Lending. And you can do Gator Lending on the course material that you're going to buy from me. Yeah, it teaches, like, the slightly have dues to lend money to the dipshits so that they can go back to him. Like, it's, like, literally a Ponzi <laughs> exactly. scheme. It's absolutely asinine. So, you know, like, basically all the sketchy stuff that you've suspected was going on there, he's already done criminal things in right. the past. He's definitely going to continue doing them going into the future. Right. Just looking at the messaging, just look at the like risk yeah, factor yeah. that comes with the sub two stuff and the kind of people that he targets with that. Like it's going to be so interesting what happens. But I've seen so many people sharing those videos, like tagging bigger pockets, like tagging Scott Trench. Good. Like the, he's going to be ousted here pretty soon. Like he has to be. I think so. I, I think that I think it's going to crack. <laughs> and I don't know if he's doing anything illegal with the subject two stuff. But I can tell you this right now, like you said, the past is going to be telling the future a little bit. And also, it's just a trash. Like, you can't, you don't want to do business with somebody that has those type of ethics. Probably. Even if everything he did right now is above board, but it's not. I can't even say that. So mm. just don't do yeah. business with people like that because you should be doing business with people that you know, like, and trust and, like, legit want to do business with and want them to be successful and they come back and make you successful. What I'm seeing is he doesn't care about anybody being successful. He cares about scale and to just take it as much money and profits as he can from his courses and his programs regardless mm -hmm. and he'll say whatever he has to to get people there yeah i would be questioning if he how much sub two stuff he's even ever done like himself yeah probably very few because I, I think most of the stuff that that he owns that he always says that he owns is things that came from within his community mm -hmm. because their whole thing is they're like oh yeah it's really complicated we can't to actually teach you how to do it use our tc company and they work themselves into mm -hmm. it that way that's yep. what i've heard through the great plan i would make total, total sense it's all skepticism. Either yeah. way, we obviously think he's a dirtbag. It was said here first. <laughs> well, it was. I mean, we're not <laughs> we, friendly we, about we, it. To be fair, we were some of the first people, I feel like, that started producing anti-Pace content. Yeah. Spidey sense, man. It kicks yeah. on. Everybody had it. We just wanted to see it because we're dicks. That was actually something that was kind of funny was when we started connecting people and they're like, I, oh, that guy sucks. Like, he's such a sleazeball. And people would be like, right? I've always thought that way, but no one said that before. Like, I had just have said it. Yeah. yeah. So I will be surprised if when I get back from Japan here at the beginning of December, if nothing has transpired from that. I mean, it just it just has to. It's time, you know, get rid of them. And then if you want to uh, learn all the stuff that he's teaching people for $10,000, go to collectingkeys.com slash sub two and uh, 
you'll be able to get our free course or sign up for like the pre-sign up for our free yeah. course that we're going to put together for sign it. Sign up for the free one. We will just give it to you for free and you won't have to go over to Pace Morby and pay him 10 grand. You can just have what he teaches for free from us. Exactly. This is something that we've conspired to do for a while. So yeah, we're going to make a completely free sub two course and we're going to, we're planning is to release it in like December, or January as the, the real estate gets a little bit slow. So, but yeah, collectingkeys.com slash S-U-B. Does he do the two or the T-O? We should do the same. He's like sub two with the number, right? I don't know, actually. I don't know. I don't know. I thought it was T-O, sub two. But that's how you, that's how it's supposed to be. I don't know what his brand is. I just want to oh. write him off. Oh, okay. Let me, let me look it up. You know what? We're going to do both. So that way it'll take you the same page. Yeah. So collectingkeys.com slash solved. sub two with the number and then also sub T-O and then also sub T-O-O in case you're one of his followers you don't know basic English. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, everybody's got to learn at some point in time. You're right. Yeah, he says at sub two, S-U-B-T-O. T-O, okay. And he's also, he's also an author of Wealth Without Cash. This is a exactly. whole other topic. Should we talk about authors today? <laughs> Why everyone has a book, which is one of our, our airplane conversations. Yeah. Let's just be grumpy today and just start calling shit out. Like, why does everybody have to have a book? Like, there's so many books out there. You know what the funny thing is, too? The level that people promote their books is inversely related to how much value they actually have to give you. So if they promote it a lot, there's no value? Yeah, like them as an individual yeah. don't have anything that actually provides you. Yeah. Well, it's also like kind of like one of the worst mediums for content anymore if you want to get a message out. Like I can't imagine people make a lot of cash doing that. I, well, I don't. A lot of it's marketing. Honestly, yeah. the problem that I have with with all the people writing books these days is that A, most people don't actually write the books. True. They pay somebody. You can hire like a ghostwriting company for mm -hmm. like ten to twenty thousand yeah. dollars. You just like kind of give them notes and they'll write it for you. To having a book used to be an accomplishment because you had to go through the publishing process, sure, which was super challenging. Rigorous, right? there's tons challenging. of rejections. Like you know, people like J.K. Rowling, right? They're famous for having mm -hmm. gotten, gotten turned down by you know fifty or sixty publishers before one finally decided to take on Harry Potter. That's an accomplishment. Now anyone and their mom can go get Harry Potter published on Amazon. Anyone can go and like have a ghostwriter write a book and just have it instantly published mm -hmm. anywhere, right? Whether that's digitally. Or ChatGPT, you could do it for free. Dude, ChatGPT books are probably already out. Oh, right? yeah. And people just say that it's their own books. You know what's yeah. even, now here's the hustle I do respect, is you have the ghostwriting companies who are charging $20,000 mm -hmm. and then having ChatGPT go write the book. No shit, like, I can respect <laughs> that hustle, go get it. Yeah, here's, right. the, here's, here's the basic plot. I, I grew up with not a lot of money in lower middle class and then I wanted more money. So I decided to invest in real estate and then I did some other real estate stuff and started a short term rental business and then other things. And now I am a millionaire. Yeah, that's a lot of them, right? All the books that we've got to have the appendix too, where they talk about what is cash flow? What does yeah. ROI stand for? Yeah, yeah, right. And they always have something about some sort of connection or whatever. Like all the books see about like freedom or the exit or cash flow, uh -huh. or like, you know, something that's talking about like not having to work a lot or whatever, right? There's so many of those that have kind of like tried to build on, you know, the Tim Ferriss models or yep. like some of those clever titles out there. But by the way, whose books were published back when you actually had to go through a publishing company, it was freaking hard to do. Right. Yeah. Well, and like, let's be honest, like, I guess I, I believe that everybody in this world has a unique story to themselves. And I think it's a fascinating powerful story that you would carry with you. But not everybody's story is like book worthy. No, most people's aren't right. Yeah. Like honestly, which is okay. Just don't pretend yeah. like they are. Another thing is too, this always rubs me the wrong way. You'll see these people and this actually is someone that I know personally that did this. They wrote a book. They go and they reach out to their entire network. Okay. Like, you know, every single person they know, they have like, they have a community and they're like, Hey, leave me a five star review for my book. Mm -hmm. You do five stars before it comes out. How can it have a thousand fucking five star reviews before it's even out? Yeah, that doesn't seem to make it make sense. That's suspect, right? That's stupid. Right, yeah, your book, and no one even knows if your book is good, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And they're just gonna do a few as like a favor that makes it completely invalid. Yeah, yeah. I think there's probably some ego with it, and some folks, you know, want like that used to be a benchmark, and so it's so easy to write a book now that people are like, I guess here's a good analogy for that. It's like, everybody used to be like, man, you make $100,000 a year, like in the 1980s, 90s, like that was a great salary. Now people say it and they're still like this, like old mindset of like that being a lot, but in reality it's not. 
So writing mm-hmm. a book is the same way. It used to be very challenging, like you you said. Now that everybody could do it, it's just like less cool. Yeah, I don't know. I think that I think that's part of it. And then there's also sort of this like mindset of if they did work hard on it, they feel like it deserves to be acknowledged. Mm-hmm. When I really don't think that hard work deserves to be acknowledged if it doesn't actually produce something good. Anything valuable. Like anything valuable. Like what's mm-hmm. the point? I can acknowledge them with hustle, but like, I don't know, I could work extremely hard and move a bunch of rocks up a hill. Does that deserve to be acknowledged? No. Not if rocks didn't do anything. Not if I just left them in a pile at the top and didn't build anything with it. Don't move piles of rocks. Right. With no purpose. It's like an entitlement thing. But then you think about books that are actually good, right? So Alex Ramosi's books, he talked about like his $100 million offers one. He wrote it, worked on that completely by himself, did nine iterations of it, worked on it for six hours a day for two and a half years. It's incredible. And that's why it's so freaking good, right? Other well people written. are like, man, I've worked on this book for three months. I am so tired. I'm so yeah. excited for it to come out now. You should all go leave me five-star reviews. Like, sure. Yeah. And I think too, with like Alex Ramosi, the way he talks about it is like he wrote it, rewrote it, wrote it. It's not like he was like taking time to add chapters. It was no. like he was trying to take shit out mm-hmm. and rewriting it. So it was so good. Like, I don't think I have that ethic if I like work ethic to write a book. I'd be like, I wrote it good enough. See ya. So I probably never write a book. He was writing that book for almost as long as we've been in our real estate business. It's wild. <laughs> right? Seriously. Yeah. And he's not even making money on it. Like, I mean, he probably is making a little bit of money, but not really. Like how yeah. cheap he sells them. Well, he's not making on the books themselves. He's talked about that. He sells them for as cheap as he can. He makes money off of the people who go through, you know, his yep. education, learn from his material, build up a business and then come to him and are like, hey, I want you to have an ownership of my business. Yep. It's a huge, like long-term lead funnel he's created. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, just so interesting to see. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like a podcast too, right? There's so many people have podcasts. So many people's podcasts suck. So people think our podcasts suck. That's fine. Totally. But the one thing I can tell you is that we at least put effort into this. We put money into this, right? We try to make it better. But never once have I gone and said to every single person that I know, hey, you should go and leave my podcast a five-star review. Yeah, I know you've never listened to it, but you should definitely just go and like... Just pump the numbers up. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I prefer to do is just buy followers by the by the thousands. That usually gets me where I want to go. In 5,000 piece blocks. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That happen, oh, you know, every week for over a year and then go and create a thing about how... Uh, well, it's because you can get 5,000 followers for like 800 bucks. There's like a, t- there's like a block, you know. Yeah, so oh, dude, way less than that. I think you oh, get really? like, no like $80, if that. Dang it. Yeah. Missed that boat, apparently. We're just haters today. We came back from KeysCon real feisty. We're all fired up. <laughs> Whatever. What's positive? What's going on that we're not talking shit about? Signing freaking deals. That's yeah, positive. I like that, We've yeah. been on fire the last couple of weeks, which has been rad. So the, the team, our team did very well. So not only were you and I not there at the same time, but our main guy, Robbie, wasn't there either. He was with us at KeysCon. Yeah, so we had just a completely just loose cannon sales team out there just working. Who knows what they're doing? I'll be honest. I was very happy and slightly surprised that all of their call numbers were still on track. Yeah, they were pretty good. I saw you trying to find something, but there wasn't a lot in there. Dude, I was. I was looking at them live for the first time. I was trying to find where they were screwing off, but they held it together. Like, you piece <laughs> of shit. You did the same as last week. Oh, wait, never mind. But you know the problem is, do you know why I'm like that? Because that's what I would what? fucking do. It's because you yeah, because I'm that dirtbag that I'm worried about. You're the guy with the the corporate guy with the jiggly mouse that keeps your bu- oh, bubble oh, green, dude. One hundred percent. When I was at Boeing, because like I had nothing to do there ever. Like I literally had a six month window yeah, where I would yeah. go to my boss and I'd be like, "Hey, I have nothing to do," and they're like, "You always have a great attitude. We're giving you a promotion." I'm like, "Sir, I have not worked for six months. This is insane." <laughs> Right. Like we love you. Yeah. And I, I couldn't take it anymore. So what I would do is I split time between two factories, which also just ha- my house happened to be in the middle. So I would, I would leave one and I'd be like, Hey, cool. I'm going to Auburn. I would be driving oh, to Auburn. God. I would pull off at my house. I would go sit down. I would go and play freaking video games for like two hours. Then I would get to Auburn. I would check in so they could like see that I was there. Yeah. yeah show your face. Get your card scanned. Mm-hmm, totally. And then I would go there. I'd talk to people, whatever. <laughs> and then I'd be like, okay, cool. I got to go back to Fredrickson. And then I would just get my car and I would drive back. These are the people that build the airplanes that you fly on across the no, world. I just designed <laughs> the airplanes. And more, more specifically, I designed the equipment that built the airplanes. Even more important. 
But you know, what was frightening was the people that are actually building the airplanes. They had no idea how any of that equipment worked. Oh God, don't say that. Or how the airplane flew. It. That changed my world forever. And I was like, if they did not have like such an insane quality checking process at Boeing, I would never go on a Boeing airplane. But their quality checking is like legit. Like they scrap 60% of the parts, at least at the wing center that I was in. Oh, yeah. really? Wow. Yeah. So like, like Boeing actually had its own rail line that would come in and would just pick up all the scrap parts and then take them to be refined back into raw materials. And this is, this is where it gets real corporate. You know where, where a lot of that goes? I found this out. It comes, comes back here. Spokane? Oh, yeah, probably. Spokane. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it does. Not all of it, but a lot of it does. Yeah, but then it gets it gets sold back to Boeing. So basically, Boeing sells the parts at a loss to the train company. Mm -hmm. And then they go and refine it, and then they sell it back to Boeing for a profit. <laughs> yeah, they melt it down. Even like the shavings, I found this out recently. This is so stupid that we're talking about this. But yeah, this, it's like a really imperfect system for Boeing. But it makes our airplane travel sort of safe. It makes it way safer because like they threw away tons of yeah. parts. But anyway, we're on a tangent. But uh, yeah, been signing a bunch of deals. We have a crazy amount in escrow right now. We have a lot of stuff moving. Yeah, a lot closing here next month. And I will say honestly to you, something that I've been super thrilled about is I feel like we've reached a good spot with our entire team where the transactions are moving, sales guys are on it, the TC um, team is on it, the data team's on it. Like it's operating pretty well. Yeah, it kind of just like works, Yeah, right? It kind of works. There's probably a few fires here and here and there to put out, but the systems we've built are like working. Yeah, and, and also too, like we have all of our, our partners for our partnership program that like are finally caught up with the process, right? They're like using the platform yeah, that yeah. we built for them to be able to see all the leads. There's good communication going mm -hmm. on. And we, yeah, like, we still have a couple of hiccups here and there, but things are just like moving along, which has been pretty cool to see. It's absolutely really a great observation actually to look at is because it's taken us a while. So we, we started out the beginning of this year, like really saying that we're going to focus on building systems so that we don't have to like be part of everything. Now we're still busy. We're still part of a lot of stuff, but really looking back now, the systems that we have built, we built, it's kind of interesting. So we built some, then we had to scrap them. We had to redo some, probably iterate that several times on each of the systems and, and processes. And they're still continuously under scrutiny. And we still find like one-offs and nuances that have to be added or put into the funnel of processes. But it really, after all that work, what are we month 11? I mean, heck yeah, dude. Like, I mean, it's just like anything you hope to get there faster, but the scale that we had to do it at, yeah, because we do have a dip, slightly different operation than most other wholesalers. Yeah. Well, and I think that the thing is, is, is what we've always been good at and what I think most people are hesitant to do is we are very quick to try new things and then to pivot when they're not working. Right. Right. And like track and retrack and be honest about it. Like that was honestly one of the big um, points of conversation at Keyscom was there was a lot of people that were kind of doing the same thing for a long period of time and they've never pivoted away to try something different. Sure. And, you know, if you want to get somewhere in business, you don't have that luxury. Like you have to be willing to make changes and you have to be willing to try new things. You have to be willing to let things fail. Like we've had some incredible failures this year. Mm -hmm. You know, like we've had some partners that we've started up with that have been absolute freaking disasters. That helped inform our system of how we uh -huh. like hire or, or bring on partners too, that it's, it's truly a partner program. Totally, right? And, and it really comes down to whenever you have those failures, it's super cheesy, but it's like, how do you turn that failure into an opportunity to learn how to be better? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and being really, really intentional about that is something that we've always really strove for. And that's how you grow. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just like nothing's going to be perfect and you have to be okay with that. I think that as when you're transitioning from like a real estate investor to like a real estate business owner, that's a really hard thing for people to do because when you're looking at real estate investments, it's very easy to have kind of like a box where you're like, this is the kind of property that I want to buy. There's my buy box. Right? They even have that term, the buy box. When it comes to business, you don't get to do that. <laughs> like, Even if you're just trying to be like a wholesaler, that's another thing too, is a lot of people come from, they're used to having their buy box or rental properties. They try to bring that to, you know, do wholesale off-market real estate. It's like, you got to just kind of be in the range and figure out how to monetize that. Yeah. And, and too, along with that, there's a lot of structure built around, like you can go out and find calculators for your buy box. Or there's a lot of people that gurus out there that talk specifically about like investing, but running a business, totally different. And we talked about this a lot at KeysCon, which was like, 
the your disc profile and like what you are going to be good at because everybody brings in their own like background and their own expertise into their business and they try to shape it based on that experience which is very valuable but that might not be what's going to get you to be able to step out of the solopreneur role or actually scale your business because you have a single point of view and you don't have the skill set to do every single role in your business at scale. Exactly. Yeah. And, and understanding that so much of, especially the real estate valuation side, if you're off market is subjective, mm -hmm. right? It's purely based on your opinion. There is room to move in either way, whether it's with the seller, whether it's with your buyer, whether it's with yourself, you know, and, and perfect example of this, our guy, Robbie, he mentioned before, he's like our internal systems developer, we call him, he's, he's kind of our, our right hand guy. But he, we've been working with him as basically a partnership client, doing stuff with him down in Florida. He got his first wholesale deal signed last week and he yeah. found his first buyer and he reached out and he was like, oh yeah, it's like a small deal. And I was like, I was like, bro, like you can get more for that from that buyer. Go back and ask for $5,000 more. And he was kind of hesitant to do it because he's not really like a sales guy. And I was like, dude, what's the worst that's going to happen is he's going to say no. And then he messaged me back. He's like, well, I just made an extra $4,000 on a two minute conversation. Exactly. There you go. It's completely subjective, right? Yeah. Even though like they told you that that was their hard price, when you go and you push back, there's a lot of wiggle room. Mm -hmm. And for them, it's only $4,000, which on a long-term view of a property is nothing. For you as the, basically the wholesaler in the middle, that's two X the profit for them. Right. You know, that's like a hundred percent difference in what you're making on the deal, which adds up very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it is a, it's a process to sell all throughout right. your business, whatever you're doing. Well, I mean, really you're yeah. always selling, even when you're hiring people or firing people or doing whatever your business is like, you're selling something, right? And you gotta be forward with that and recognize that. Otherwise you're gonna be kind of not doing so well. Yeah, exactly. So but either way, we're going into December with a ton. I think we have out on the books right now, 12-ish, 13-ish closings for just in December, which will be like our biggest closing we've ever had December. Because usually a lot of our stuff closes early or kicks off into January. It's pushed out. So I'll be interested mm -hmm. to see how that all pans out. Yeah, we'll see how well the title companies withstand that. Almost all of it's before Christmas. I think I think oh, we only good. have one that's after Christmas, which I, I wouldn't be surprised if that one kicks out to January. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we have a ton though that are in the first couple of weeks of December. Either way, it's good stuff. It's fun, fun to see it all clicking. Yeah. Um, and then all across the the country too, we just had such an increase in in lead leads coming in, and I'm really interested to see what things look like finishing out the year and going into next year. A lot of the big, I would say, like economic analyzers that I follow out there are saying that they think that Q1 is going to be a major test, kind of for everyone. Yeah, I think when Q4 earnings come out in Q1 from after the holidays, because that's usually like you get to see the bump, like. Because a lot of people, like just the general market, a lot of their sales and some companies, it's a large percentage of their sales come during the holidays. Mm -hmm. And so they're expecting that bump from a revenue standpoint. If that doesn't happen, then the broader economy will definitely see a hit. And then also it just speaks to what's the Fed going to do because they chose to not raise rates in November, hold flat. And so then how's that broader economy handling it? And then what's going to break? Yeah, because something's going to go unbalanced. Yeah, I was actually listening to this podcast um, yesterday and it was really interesting where they were breaking it down and they were like, if you look at the amount to bail out a lot of the banks and a lot of like the hedge funds and the insurance companies that are losing their ass on all these commercial properties right now, if you look at like, the total amount versus if they just went and gave a universal basic income to all the people whose pensions and whose, you know, retirements and, you know, general incomes are affected uh -huh. by those things collapsing. What's actually more for the government to pay, right? Is it the bailout or is it just having the universal basic income for a set period of time? I would imagine just because like that's how this seems to be positioned is that the, the universal basic income would be less. It is less. Exactly. Then paying out these people so their CEOs can continue to collect 40, 60, 80, $100 million bonuses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that and that's exactly what they were going through is they were going through the numbers and that it is literally less if you take like the lower 10% of the United States as well as all the people that have their pensions and everything else that are threatened by these commercial assets that back all of the pensions collapsing. Mm -hmm. It is less to just pay those people than to go and bail out the DECA millionaires and the billionaires and the banks that are taking yep. all these properties. Totally. 
So like mathematically, it makes more sense for the government to do that. Have you heard of this term? This is brand new to me as of yesterday, this term that we're in a silent depression. I saw that on like an Instagram thing. I don't really know what it means. Part of me feels like that's like a Gen Z, like whiny bitch term. Like that's what they call when they get sent to their room. You know, when they're when they're right. 25 yeah. so living with their mom and they get sent Silent to their room. Depression. Part of me thinks that, right? Because in the depression, like people weren't eating, right? They weren't going to Chipotle, right? But there are a few statistics that show like compared to the the depression in the 20s till now, there's actually the, the average income's like lower and the mm-hmm. cost of housing's higher, like, you know, using inflation to account for that. But it just kind of speaks to like maybe the sentiment from a lot of folks, and especially maybe the younger uh, generations out there right now? I think the difference is right now is the logistics system is better. So you don't have like what you have in the depression where people just like didn't have access to food. Mm-hmm. Now there's access to food. People just can't afford it. I don't, like I said, I don't know. Chipotle is still popping, dude. <laughs> and we have social programs now that we didn't have back then. Those didn't, those exist because of the depression. Correct. So people that are, I think the challenge is, is the people that aren't low enough income so basically they don't get those services or mm-hmm. at least enough to cover their their expenses, but they don't have enough to really get beyond where they are now. Yeah, those are the ones that get wrecked. I mean, just like every time, right? Uh, it's always the middle yep. class that gets toasted because they take care of the poor people. The rich people are able to take care of themselves. Yep. I don't know. It'll be interesting, but so many people are pointing to Q1 of 2024 kind of being the turning point, especially going into an election season. Because none of the politicians care. Yeah. They just care about getting reelected and who's and who's going to yeah. be the next president, right? Everybody's kicking tire or cans down the road. Like when I become president, we'll fix the stinking economy, all that sort of stuff. And yeah, I think I think you're probably right. That's a good time, the Q1, to to like look forward and to see all the hopefully great opportunity. And being in the game now is the best time to do it because you're prepped and you're ready to rock and roll. Because that's one thing I do I do notice is to keep your ear close to the to the tracks, so <laughs> to speak, because that's how you know when things start to become good opportunities. Yeah, totally right. And, and I think that one of the biggest, I would say, like things that I've seen that just shows how disconnected politicians are from the rest of us, just like artificially. Um, someone posted this video and it was in San Francisco. I guess Kamala Harris was doing a talk there. And uh, there was like this street that was full of homeless people. Someone had like yeah. this video. And then it was like, when she's coming to visit, no homeless people, the entire thing's freaking caged. So no one could possibly like get in there. Oh my gosh. And that was like her like route to like get to wherever she was speaking. And then she was gonna be speaking outside. So, you know, she could be there. No homeless people can possibly get to her. Like you have to be led into like the complex. And then she was leaving. So she never even like sees the reality, right? She can see it online, but it's never actually exposed to them. Into your face. And right there. That is like some feudal, you know, medieval bullshit, right? Where they just like are fencing out all the peasants. That's like they can't, same stuff they do in China that everyone here talks uh-huh. trash about. They're literally doing the exact same thing. Boy. Right. And like that goes on and you really think that they're going to care about any of our problems? Fuck no. No, you got to figure your shit out yourself. You got, you can't rely on the government to help you, man. No. So anyways, well, we went all over. This episode was a roller coaster. So yeah, we got after guys. today. If that's not for you, I don't know what to tell you because that was uh, all of our opinions early well, on our sleeve. If we're not your tribe, that's okay. We're yeah. someone's. But I tell you what, I know we got at least 15 guys that were, were diehard, you know, best friends after after a weekend. So yep. it was yeah, a because we held them captive in the house and they had to get the hell out of there before they could like say something else. <laughs> oh, dude, it was, it was definitely not. I know it wasn't that vibe because honestly, if we weren't there, they would have still had just a good of a time. Yeah, we were just kind of accessories, to be honest. Like, honestly, the fact that we were there was probably kind of a drag. They would have had a much better time just, like, sitting around talking about real estate. I'm still, like, dreaming about the whiskey that we had. Like, that was so good. Did you get a glass? You got a glass, right? Of the backer up? I don't know. Maybe you didn't think it was as good as I did. I thought it was fantastic. I, like, it was good. Like, being a whiskey guy, that just isn't as novel of a thing for me. Um, I started not being a whiskey guy, but... uh, Yeah, yeah. I can get behind it. It was good. I, I enjoyed it. it. it I enjoyed good. the novelty of it. I enjoyed the presentation of it. Yeah, we had a pretty nice bottle. We bought a bottle for the group just to pass around for those that drink. Not everybody drinks, but what was it? Woodford Reserve Baccarat. And man, I love it. Like, I'm not a big, big drinker, but I do like a good whiskey. Like yeah. a good, just flavorful whiskey. And it, I don't know, it was good. It was very silky smooth. Yeah, see, I'll, I'll drink like just. I'll have to wait till next well. year to see what we buy because I'm, I'm always down to have something Gucci. Yeah. Oh, it's always good just to splurge or something, especially for a special event like that. It's fun. Yeah. Um, Thank so, you. Cool. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. 
once again, if you want to sign up for our waiting list, I guess our waiting list, our alert list for our free sub two course that we're going to release, it's just a big middle finger to Mr. Pace himself. Go to uh, collectingkeys.com slash sub two. That'll be slash S-U-B and the number two. Also S-U-B-T-O. Also with the T-O-O, just in case. you know. English all of them. We got you. We're going to do all of them. Point yeah. to the same page. Yeah. But go check that out and we'll let you know when we release our free course, which teaches you everything that they teach over in the sub two community, but it'll be completely free. And besides that, share this episode with anyone who's interested in real estate and making money or just listening to two more white guys talking about their opinions live on the internet for no one to listen to. There's an audience for that. I know there is because they slowly has been growing for over two years. It's trickling in. It's trickling in. But uh, yeah, besides that, thanks everybody. We appreciate you all and we'll talk to you next week. See y'all.